Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, August 22nd, 2017 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Virginia Beach, Virginia. Cryptocurrency initial coin offerings continue to be easy pickings for attackers. The latest example is Enigma, a currency that is supposed to go live on September 11th. They already solicited funds, but sadly their domain Enigma.co got taken over by an attacker who then stole about $500,000 worth of cryptocurrencies. The response, I think, actually highlights a little bit the mindset of some of these companies that are starting these crypto kinds. They're stating here that they're changing all passwords, engaging two-factor authentication and taking other security precautions, in particular, not engaging two-factor authentications on, for example, their domain registrar account which may have been compromised here is something that probably should not have done in hindsight. Now sticking with cryptocurrencies here for a second story, one of the perceived advantages of cryptocurrencies is sometimes privacy. Now we all know that with Bitcoin it is possible to follow transactions within the Bitcoin network but the difficult part tends to be to link a certain Bitcoin wallet to an actual person. Well, a paper by researchers from Princeton University does show that this may not be all that difficult because a lot of e-commerce websites that do accept Bitcoin also do use third-party trackers, for example, in order to track the effectiveness of advertisements. These third-party trackers may in some cases receive the receiving Bitcoin address, which is the Bitcoin address of the merchant. They may also receive the amount being transmitted. With that, it's typically possible to determine the wallet from which the Bitcoin transaction originated, which of course is the customer's wallet. Now, these third party organizations, of course, do receive data from more than one website and data they are receiving from another e-commerce website that may, for example, leak some of the identifying information from this particular customer can then be linked to the Bitcoin transaction, which in turn links the wallet of the user to a particular identity. Overall, of course, this is sort of part of the business that these third-party trackers are in, where they're able to correlate data they collect from different e-commerce websites in order to learn more about specific customers. Standard best practices, like for example, the use of uh, plugins that will remove respective cookies and the like, tend to help and make it at least more difficult for these services to track users. And then there is a new exploit that apparently makes it possible to enter an unlimited number of passcodes into a locked iPhone. The way this works is that you're able to flash your iPhone to the current firmware, not entering a passcode. And the first screen that comes up after you do so, before you actually set up the phone does require your passcode but is not affected by your lockout policy and apparently there is now a device being sold in China for $500 that automates the process and allows you to enter these passcodes very rapidly without having to actually manually go through all the possible passcodes. Pretty interesting exploit. It does work on iOS 10.3.3 which is the current version version also works on some of the early iOS 11 betas, but apparently Apple announced that they will fix it in the final release of iOS 11 and it may already be fixed in the very latest beta version of iOS 11. Now the speed is still pretty slow and limited to I believe one passcode per 50 seconds, uh, but uh, due to the automation of course it's certainly possible to cover a large number of passcodes using this method. 
Currently the iPhone 7 and 7 Plus are affected. There are some rumors that it may also affect the iPhone 6 and 6S. And then it looks like the SyncCrypt ransomware is up to new tricks in order to bypass antivirus. Now, the malware itself initially arrives as a Windows script file, so WSF file, but that file doesn't really include much code. It does appear to download images. However, inside those images, there are embedded zip files that contain the actual malicious code. So the WSF script will then extract that code, unzip the files, execute them, and you end up with an encrypted disk. But well, that's it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow.